genes are patient. My grandmother, that's her soul, had it on the family tradition in Bangladesh of remembering the family for history. And she kept on repeating it to us until one day we said, if we don't write this down, we will forget. Because when we went back, go back to our family tradition, 45 generations ago, we were in Arabia. Khalid bin Walid, Saif Islam, is it somebody that I claim direct descendants from. We were Arabs who changed sides, initially fighting the Prophet, and then converting to Islam. And then Saif Islam became the most trusted general that Prophet had. That is the direct lineage I have, repeated through tradition and oral history. But it's not just on hearsay. We've been able to trace it person after person after person. What happened? They moved from Saudi Arabia, they set up uh, in Baghdad when the, 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 the Caliphate moved there. From there they moved to Afghanistan, from there they moved to Northern India, and then finally they settled in what is now in the world. So we are from an Arab tradition that settled in, in Baghdad. And in a way that is how religion came here. You are part of that same tradition of, of religion moving by by land and by sea. And at one time, almost all of the coastal archipelago of Philippines was belonging to the Muslim community. It's through your history that you find yourself compressed in the territory areas that you are now in. So what does that mean? It means that as a subset of the Muslim tradition, we have created, we are not necessarily Arab Muslims, we are not necessarily Indonesian Muslims uh, or anything else of our cultural heritage, of our geographical locality, and what we have now become. And I say this because the other challenge or pressure we are facing now is people are now trying to redefine what a true Muslim should look like, how they should speak, and how they should behave. There is no such tradition. We are not all compelled to become Wahhabis or Salafis or Shia or anything else. We have our own traditions which are valid. You, your culture here is valid. The culture in Indonesia is valid, in Malaysia, in India, in Pakistan, elsewhere. You can, as long as you claim the Shahada, you are Muslim and Muslim. Within that tradition is a tradition of tolerance and respect for other communities. That's also important. It's important not just in the United Kingdom where we are a minority in a majority uh, Roman Christian society. It is equivalent, but also where the Muslim are in the majority and there are minority communities. And uh, when we talk today about the Bangs tomorrow, you are soon on a journey of having been a minority with a long, long list of issues that you want to address to a situation where you will form a majority administration under whom other faiths and traditions we have to live. And we will have to remember that the many things that you claim you have suffered from cannot become something that you continue when you are in the majority here. So that's why I want to spend a little bit of time about the, the different traditions of Islam as it has like moved from one community to another. At one level we are the same, at another we can be different. But that difference is not something that is wrong, it is something that simply reflects the reality. So finally, let me move on to my job as the British Ambassador, as to why I'm here, what I'm trying to achieve, and why we believe that this achievement program is something that you should become advocates of and embrace. To understand our role, particularly in the whole peace process, we probably need to go back to the years that we've invested in this. And our story really goes back to the day on which the Moab was ruled as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. And there was very little hope that probably here and the existing international partners that this process could be revived. But because we had signals from the MILF and others in the government here that they want to keep the process alive, 
I was then the regional head for ASEAN, Australia, New Zealand, Pacific, looking at with our foreign policy in this part of the world. And I went to our uh, foreign secretary and said, will you give us permission to engage in dialogue, to make a contribution to this process, and see where this leads us? And the then foreign secretary agreed. And that was the beginning of our engagement, initially through our ambassador, Peter Beckingham, then substantially through our ambassador, Stephen Lilly. And I arrived here one year, two months ago, to take up the, the task of hopefully seeing this process through to its formal finishing line. But it's not been just the ambassadors who have been doing this work. Uh, my colleagues in the embassy have been working relentlessly, and the, the one colleague here in this room, Tom Fix in the back, I think has attended every single panel meeting in Kuala Lumpur, in Damal, that is impossible in the last three years. And when he couldn't attend, I attended. When I couldn't attend, my deputy attended. There has always been a British presence in physically throughout this whole process. We've been there as your guests. We've not been there to interfere. But we felt we had a story to share with you, a painful story of our own uh, troubles, the long, long Catholic Protestant uh, conflict in Northern Ireland. And because we went through that peace process, because the two sides were reconciled, we have a parliamentary form of government. Because we now have an administration where people who formerly were arch enemies and killing each other have sit together as government. And because no one in the United Kingdom wants to go back to the days preceding the Good Friday Agreement, we felt we had something of relevance to share with you. Sometimes we have spoken very candidly, and some of our advice has been perhaps harsh not just to the negotiators after the MIF, but also to the government of the Philippines. But in, in all our interventions and in all our work, the focus has been the achievement of lasting peace. And as long as we remain on track, then we are still with you and work with you. And our commitment will continue, not just in money, though that is important, but in physical commitment, in giving you moral support, and by doing other things that with you. Which finally leads me to achieving scholarship. What is it? Firstly, the main achievement comes from the house that the government provides to the foreign secretary outside of London, where he can entertain his guests, where he can relax. But it's not his house, it is the government's house, and it is used uh, for many, many things. It was that name of that house was given to the government scholarship scheme, uh, which began exactly. 30 years ago. And in fact, in his first year, there was a Filipino uh, scholar. And I met him just the other day. So there's proof that uh, you know, there's, uh, there are alumni going back each of the 30 years that we've been running the scheme. The scheme is for a postgraduate degree, a master's degree. You don't select the subject, the applicant selects the subject. It can be anything. And we've just sent somebody who's interested in marine preservation. We have lawyers. We have uh, somebody who's just gone to study Islamic finance. We've got people who have gone to study administration. The, the subject is not the issue. The big question is, what will the scholar bring back to the community? What will their contribution be? That is the most important thing. This is not an immigration ticket. It's not a, where you study and you live abroad and go to the UK. The commitment the person has to make is that they are, their heart and soul is for this country. They want to use their knowledge and their talent to improve the Philippines. That is also why we don't take somebody who's fresh out of college in the first degree. We wait until they've had at least two years of experience working somewhere so that they have some maturity, some life experience. And their, their, their outlook is not purely academic, it's also practical. And with that, there is a competition. It's an open competition. We have a panel, we interview people, and the best students get through. And just to prove how strict we are, last year we actually had 10 available spots. Only eight went this year. 
we would have had nine, but uh, the gentleman concerned made a fatal mistake. He did not ask the most important person in the household whether he could go to the United Kingdom or not. His wife. And his wife said, no. <laughs> An important lesson. Make sure you talk to your wife uh, before you, uh, you make your application. That's the first piece of advice I can give you. The, the tenth position remained vacant because we did not think that any of the applicants met our standard, which is, as I said, somebody who can justify why they want to go and study, what contribution they will make to the Philippines, and what is motivating them to apply. This is not just something for the rich and the elite. We don't care whether they went to Ateneo or whether to Yudhidilaman. We care about your commitment, your passion, and what you would actually need to do. But the good news is that instead of just 30 last year, we will increase it, inshallah, this coming year to 30. In the 30th year of Chile, there will be 30 Chilean scholars from the Philippines. Triple the number. The significance of this is twofold. There are many countries in the world where we have no Chile scholarship program at all. So this is not something that we are just giving every country a little bit uh, and hoping that from these small seeds, big trees will grow. We are choosing carefully where we plant the Chile seed. And we believe from our, the history of this scholarship program in the Philippines, the high quality students, and you hear from them, but this is a place where we want to plant more seeds. So, 30. We're doing this because the government is putting on its commitment, but also a many, many Philippine companies, both uh, complete Philippine companies, like uh, the Bank of the Philippine Islands and the uh, Manifagina's group, others are joining and, and providing some funding to be able as far as go. Also, British companies who are operating in here, like uh, HSC. So they are also making contribution. Put all of that together, we get to the magic number of 30. The one thing we have managed to do within that 30 is to set aside five for the Banasamoro Chile program. What does that mean? It does not mean it's a scholarship program for Muslims. It does not mean that we will lower the standard just so that someone who wants someone can come through. Because I simply don't accept the proposition that we do not have good enough unsummable people to meet our standard. They exist because we have them already. It doesn't mean that they have to be living in Kapapato or in Honda in Palutam or Sulu. That would be an advantage. It simply means that whether you are no matter whether you're Christian, whether you're Catholic, whether you're INC or Muslim or no faith whatsoever, if your commitment is to do good for the Bhaktanur, as an administrator, as a scholar, as, a, as an effective individual, this is for you. Make sure that people understand that when you go and talk to them and, and spread that, that news so that we have high quality applicants to choose from. And if we get from the the, from the, this whole exercise, more than five who qualify. We will look at them. Because if 10 scholars come from this ter territory overall, and they, they present themselves as the best possible candidates overall, there is no reason why they cannot be more. But five is our minimum commitment we are making to this exercise. Uh, believe me, it's not been easy to secure this in this way, because in our country, it's very difficult to start to like, discriminate or make a special provision or whatever. But our colleagues in the UK have understood what it is we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is to meet a, 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 a gap, which is that in the project that we're all working on together, which is the new Mass Moral Administration, if you do not have people with the right skills in, in essential elements of governance, it will be a it, not impossible, but just more difficult to achieve what we're trying to do. And by having this talent that you can grab hold of and 
use. I think the future of that tomorrow will be more assured. That is what I wanted to say to you today. I want you to become my partner and the partner of my team. And Anna's here is the, the officer of the software achievement program. All the information is available through, through her. But at any stage, if you have any questions, you all you have to do is ask. But by my my real request is to for you to take over my job because I can't be here every day. Please become our ambassadors for this very worthy project. And inshallah you will see the benefits, not just in year one, but in the next 30 years of this investment in education. Which is why I go back to where I started. The tradition of education is not new for our community. We need to recapture that tradition and to prove that we are educated, able, capable people, applying our principles to do good for the benefit of the people we serve, whether it's here or in our home country or the United Thank you very much for your attention.